I've spent the past couple months running riding challenges over on our Discord, link below, and I've read and scored every single submission. And in working with these emerging authors, a nicer way to say newer writers, I see the same mistakes being made time and time again, and it is the biggest barrier between someone writing a story that is flat and someone writing a story that is engaging and dynamic for the reader, that, that sucks the reader in. Stick around for the last one because it is the most important skill to learn for strong storytelling. These are the three storytelling sins. First, let's note that everyone is learning to write at different times and at different paces. Do not, I repeat, do not sit there and compare yourself to other writers as a judge of your own skill. This isn't even one of the storytelling sins, it's just something that I see come up pretty often. Especially emerging writers who write a couple chapters of their draft and then they compare it to the published books that inspire them and get demoralized. You fool. Those books are the culminations of sometimes years of work between a writer and a team of different professional top of the line editors. Published books are a completely different beast. Stop comparing yourself to your favorite authors while you're writing a draft. Hey. <laughs> That's silly. Hey, oh, yeah, 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 thanks. Yeah, thanks. This video is sponsored by no one. This is a one man show. If you want to make your story as strong as possible, then I have great news for you. As of right now, I am opening up my services as a book coach and developmental editor. If you really want to take writing seriously, then head to my website, www.writingtheory.com slash coaching and check it out. A book coach works alongside an author as they write their draft to help direct the story, keep the author accountable and motivated, and bring the characters and plot and the setting alive. It's a recurring meeting that happens every time you hit that next milestone in your story. If you've already finished your draft, then consider my developmental editor services. This is where you send me your entire manuscript, I read it, and then we sit down for a two hour meeting with a ton of notes and graphs and ideas for where the story can be improved. I will only work with you if I think that we can truly make something fantastic. So head over to my website, fill out the form there. The first meeting is free as we get on the same page about what the deliverables are and what to expect through this. And then we can hit the ground running. I hope to see your writing soon. Oh, yeah, excuse me. The first storytelling sin is what John Gardner in his book, The Art of Fiction calls psychic distance. You can watch this video here for a full breakdown of that book if you're interested, but here's the spark notes on Psychic Distance. First off, great band name, Dibs. John Gardner says that Psychic Distance is the closeness between the reader and our perspective character or characters. Basically, are we in that character's head or are we observing that character from afar? A close psychic distance would be the reader experiencing the thoughts of the character. We're privy to everything in their mind. A removed psychic distance would be us simply seeing the character react to things. We don't see in their head, we just see their actions. That's like, that's the removed psychic distance. Here are three examples. It was winter of the year 1853. A large man stepped out of a doorway. Henry hated snowstorms. He brushed the snow from his collar and fought back a chill. He was sick of the cold. He missed that summer heat. Each of these examples shows a different level of that psychic distance. Now that we know what this term means, what about psychic distance becomes a storytelling sin? The mistake that emerging writers make is not one of choosing the wrong psychic distance, even though I do think that that is possible. Instead, it's not being consistent in the psychic distance that you choose. The psychic distance of your story should be rock solid. It should be unwavering. If we're in the head of your character, we shouldn't at some later point in the story suddenly be out of their head. It's all or nothing. You choose one and you stick with it. Switching that psychic distance is extremely jarring for readers and it's something that is impossible to ignore, which is why it's the first storytelling sin. You can avoid this changing of psychic distance by practicing, studying, and analyzing stories with rock solid point of view. 
Because at its core, this is a major aspect of the POV of your novel. Reading the authors that you love and understanding the choices that they make regarding POV can help you figure out how you want to approach it. You can study The Will of the Many by James Islington for incredible first-person perspective and a close psychic distance. And you can study Game of Thrones for rock-solid third-person perspective, links below. An extra little quick tip regarding psychic distance is that your characters need to respond in the same psychic distance to surprising wild new information as they would with mundane information. If we're in the character's head when they discover who the killer of our story is, we should also be in their head when mulling over details while sipping on a cup of coffee. Nothing changes psychic distance. <clears throat> hey, oh, if you yeah. don't mind. The second storytelling sin is that of dialogue. Do yourself a favor, go watch this three-part series on dialogue. Part one is all about the necessities of dialogue. How much dialogue should you have? How do you format it? Part two is a writing book breakdown on Robert McKee's dialogue. And part three answers all of the questions that you posted in the YouTube comments and the Discord. All of the frequently asked questions. Dialogue becomes a storytelling sin when you don't include enough of it. And this is a folly of a writer not being fully comfortable with their characters more than anything else. Dialogue plays an insanely important role in your story. It should be the vessel for world building information, for character information, for plot movement, everything. Crack open one of your favorite books and really read through that book intentionally and you'll see that dialogue isn't just fun banter between characters, but that dialogue contains all the information that you need as a reader to be invested in the book. That term, that, that definition here, the information that a reader needs to be invested in a book, that's called exposition. And if you are presenting your exposition in the narration of your story, in the details that you write, then you're doing it wrong. When you're writing your story, dialogue should be present every couple paragraphs at minimum. At any point in your story, any point, at bare minimum, I don't care if your characters are sneaking through the halls of some evil wizard's castle and they have to be quiet, make them talk. We as readers need to experience those characters. We want to see how they react to the world because we learn about the world based on their reactions. In part one of that dialogue series that I mentioned before, I took five or six books of different genres and I took random 1,000 word passages just to see how much dialogue each book used within those 1,000 words. In any 1,000 word passage of your story, there should be an average of 34 lines of dialogue. Yes, that is how much of your story should be dialogue. 34 lines of dialogue per 1,000 words. If you don't have this amount of dialogue, then so much of your story is being told through action and narration and detail. And that doesn't immediately sound like a bad thing, does it? But the effects of this kind of story is kind of like that of a silent movie. You will never feel as connected to a character that doesn't get the chance to speak. Yes, we see those characters do things, but we don't understand them. It is a critical part of your story that's missing. This may be the most common storytelling sin that I see in emerging writers. Do not underestimate your dialogue. You can usually fix this storytelling sin by also avoiding the next one. Oh, yeah, yeah. All right. The last storytelling sin is one of the hardest to overcome as an emerging writer. It's like a switch in your brain that has to be flipped. And if you don't flip this switch, then you cannot make it as a writer. Your stories will never impact the reader in the way that you want them to. The last storytelling sin is that of the scene. A story, the full start to finish reading experience, should be a collection of specific scenes. Those scenes should be interactions between characters, moments of positive or negative change that move the plots and the characters forward in their respective journeys. The biggest storytelling sin that you can commit is not utilizing scenes in your story like you should. What exactly do I mean by this? I mean that I see time and time again emerging writers wanting to tell a story and they write it almost like an overview of the action. 
the movements of an army or the actions of a character running through the forest and bumping into another character, a brief interaction, and then more action of that person running through the forest and doing X, Y, or Z. Stories are composed of scenes. Each scene is a zoomed in, up close experience of something happening. These scenes showcase the characters and their interactions. Your story that you write should be a string of connected scenes. Some authors would even call those scenes sequences. And those should tell the overarching story. If you are writing paragraphs and paragraphs of action or world detail or movements and not zooming in to the character interactions, then your story is more of an action montage than a true story. And you know this. That's why movies aren't just 100% action. Yeah, there are some action scenes. Yes, we get these kind of montages in movies, but every movie is broken into scenes. In these scenes, characters get the focus. We watch them interact. We hear their dialogue. We see their response. And then the scene ends and we move on to the next one. This is the absolute basics of modern storytelling. You have to understand the scene. A great resource for understanding how to create effective scenes is in The Story Grid by Sean Coyne. I did a video on this book a while ago and I got a ton out of it. I quote so many things from this book. The actual detail of this like story grid framework that the book uses to analyze a story is just one of its many takeaways. I consider that book to be a must read for writers who want to take storytelling seriously. There's a link below. To avoid this storytelling sin, it's easy. Sit down and write a scene. Write a 1000 word excerpt from a story where something changes. If you're worried that the stories that you've written so far break this storytelling sin, then sit down and write a detailed scene. You could even try adding a scene to your favorite book. Use that book's characters and plot and setting and even that author's writing style and try to create a scene that fits between two chapters. This is one of the best ways to figure out how specific, how detailed your scenes need to be. Write a new scene for a book that you love. If you can't fit the same amount of detail or dialogue into that scene, then you have room to improve. It tests your writing styles, your pacing, your psychic distance, your ability to write dialogue, and more. Once you feel like you can write a scene that fits right in with that story, then you figured it out. You can create a scene that accomplishes everything that it needs to. These storytelling scenes are just the most common ones I come across in reading and working with other writers. These are like the foundational skills that a writer needs. And if you can establish yourself with those foundational skills, then everything that comes after it just serves to strengthen your storytelling. But without these skills, by continuously falling for, for these storytelling sins, there is a very present ceiling for how effective your stories can be. What do you think? Did I miss any storytelling sins? Let me know below. I want to help you become a great storyteller. If you have a story in your head and you want to get it out, then I want to make that possible. If you don't tell that story, then no one else ever will. Come join us in the Discord and again, check out my website for more information regarding book coaching and developmental editing. I hope to see you in the Discord and as always, thank you for watching.